next will be uh, Clem Darling, who's the immediate past president of our society, uh, giving a talk on the open repair of uh, thoracal abdominal hangers. So, Clem. As the education process goes for general surgery and for trauma surgery, nobody in the operating room knows how to operate anymore. So 20% um, uh, of our work as vascular surgeons, at least in our practice and in many practices around the country, especially bigger practices, is helping or rescuing uh, specialists or generalists from, from their problems. Um, we do one to two cases a week with either urology, uh, neurosurgery, orthopedics, uh, or on, um, the urologists um, to resect tumors or to move furniture out of the way so they don't damage the blood vessels. So you really need to know how to do open surgery, whether you like it or not, at least for the next 10 years. So uh, I'm uh, not as negative as Mal is, but mainly because when you do uh, complex open aortic uh, surgery, you have to be positive because each complication kind of eats away at your soul. Um, so one of the things I think also is people love to make a separation between open and endovascular surgery. And the truth of the matter is it's all 3D, um, all 3D uh, imaging that you're looking at and you're really looking at it the same way. You're just designing a different way to reconstruct those blood vessels. Uh, so I would, I would say whenever you look at a CAT scan, just think of it as an open or an endovascular process that you're trying to fix it and they aren't mutually exclusive. I want to thank Alan for inviting me and keeping me up till very late last night. Um, you know, the open thoracic, thoracic aneurysm repair is, is obviously decreasing because thoracic and vascular repair is getting much better. Um, however, there still is a need, to, a need for it. And I, I, again, I work closely with our cardiac surgeons. I'm sorry, I don't think it's... Uh, but it's really a complex operation that needs a lot of planning and needs a lot of teamwork. And I think no, there's no place in the country that does it better than uh, Houston. And it's somewhat embarrassing to be able to speak about this in, uh, in Houston. Um, it's uh, thoracic aneurysms have increased. And the reason why t uh, TVAR has increased or thoracic en endografts have increased is because many of these patients are sick. They have uh, uh, COPD and they were kind of sequestered away because they thought the complications of the operations are, are much worse than the natural history of the disease. Um, the distal aorta is usually about the size of your thumb, it's about 2.8 uh, uh, centimeters and so obviously once it gets to be 6 centimeters that's when you start thinking about uh, repairing it. Uh, and aneurysm growth is uh, related to size as, you, as we all know. Um, so we uh, usually repair the ascending around six, so the cardiac surgeons do, um, and uh, the descending aorta is about five and a half to six also, depending on the patient's um, comorbidities. And small aneurysms really have a low risk of rupture, except for saccular aneurysms, and as was mentioned earlier, saccular, saccular aneurysms, one has to really worry about infection. Oddly enough, we've done four uh, arch infections uh, in the last year and a half, two open and two endo. Um, and that's a very complex repair to do. And I could say the endovascular repairs haven't worked very well and the open repairs are a little bit complicated to do. Um, and I won't go on to this, but if you look at uh, Tony Estrera's and uh, uh, Joe Caselli's data as well as Lars Svensson, they've all have excellent data, and, and, but I would argue, as was mentioned before, Give Up Church wrote this paper, which I, I'm sorry you can't read, but it's the same paper that was quoted earlier. If you look nationally, it's about 22% mortality for elective procedures, and that's one of the reasons why most of these procedures now are centralized uh, in, in certain centers around the country, and I think that's appropriate. Predictors of death for thoracic aneurysms are renal failure, advanced age, functional status, um, and emergent or urgent surgery. Uh, so we try to stay away from these. Those patients with renal failure have a somewhere around fourfold increase in mortality. So uh, preoperative renal failure is a, is a true a negative predictor, and we usually uh, wait on those patients for longer because they're gonna, if they're going to go on to dialysis, they're going to die from that before they die from the ruptured aneurysm. Uh, sorry again for the, oh, it's better on color on yours than mine, uh, but this is the, the types of, uh, th of, of thoracic aneurysms that we deal with. Um, CSF drainage uh, is interesting. The data on it is fairly good, but not, um, I would say, uh, true hard data. Each uh, center, if you look at Charles Asher's data in Wisconsin, he does not drain uh, CSF. He treats with them by giving them naloxone, uh, or he actually, he does CSF drainage, he treats them with naloxone, uh, and he keeps their pressure high. He uh, does not reimplant any of the intercostals. If you look at Mel Williams' data, he used to do selective angiograms of each intervertebral inter, uh, space to look at each of the, uh, the intercostals to see which ones he should implant. 
all of them have the exact same uh, uh, stroke and uh, paraplegic complications, so I can't say one is better than the other. But all of us uh, in open surgery uh, will put CSF drainage uh, and try to keep it less than 10 uh, and cap it usually for a day or so before we take it out. Uh, in endovascular surgery, the more the, uh, as was mentioned in that beautiful talk before, uh, paraplegia is about 4% in open surgery, depending on how much aorta you cover, is up to 20%. Uh, so in endovascular surgery, sometimes you get away with not putting it in unless they've had a prior end in for renal repair. Um, and in uh, open surgery, it almost always has to. And you worry about the T, T8 uh, to T12 uh, lumbars uh, that you may want to reimplant. And this is some of what, what it looks like when you do this type of operation. It's not a minimally invasive procedure. As Hazem uh, Safi will tell you, it's an extensive procedure uh, that involves uh, cardiac anesthesia and uh, a lot of people in the peri perioperative period. Uh, many of us use le uh, left atrial femoral bypass, the poor man's op uh, Option is what we've used in our, this was by doing a right axe fem prior to the operation and then using that as to offload the heart and to uh, give uh, peripheral uh, perfusion while you're sequentially clamping the aorta. Sorry. Um, you know, the left atrial bypass, uh, so the thoracic abdominal incision, as, as you can see here, is fairly extensive. Usually it's from the left, uh, the lateral left uh, rectus muscle, you can go paramedian, and then taken up through whatever interspace you need to, usually to third, fourth, if you're going all the way up to the top. Uh, we, I, I'm going to, because of the dissection that uh, Masmal talked about at the end of this, I'm going to talk a little bit about retroperitoneal aortic exposure, just because I, I think it's something you really should know, and it's very important. Um, so this is uh, what the repair will look like with the visceral vessels reconstructed. Uh, in the old days, we used to, we've gone from doing selective reimplantations of the intercostals, either as a patch or with a, with a side graft, and uh, the visceral vessels, we used to use a patch, but many times we had degeneration over time of that into aneurysm formation, so uh, many of us have actually gone to sequentially clamping the thoracic aorta and, and, uh, and bypassing to each of the celiac SMA and renals one at a time. Um, and this is, you know, sometimes if you're, if you're replacing the entire extent of the aorta, you need to do uh, two intercostal uh, incisions in order to get good exposure. It's really arduous, and patients have uh, significant complications after that. Uh, but getting back to just basic aortic surgery, the goals are to minimize uh, endorgan ischemia, mi minimize cardiac work, and minimize the trauma of this, of this huge operation. And you have to have a good plan when you go in. Um, so you really want to... Prepare the problem. You need a good plan when you go in. You need the anesthesiologist and the nurses to all be on the same page. Um, and you need to figure out exactly where you're going to clamp well before you get in there. Um, and you have to figure out some type of visceral protection for, uh, for these patients. And then use of adjuncts, as I mentioned, uh, in order to protect the spinal cord and protect uh, the bowel. But again, going back to it, I would argue when you look at the CAT scan to prepare these patients, it's very much like looking at a CAT scan for doing an endograft. You, look, want the, you want to place your aortic clamp once. You don't want to move it. You don't want to manipulate it. It's much like the landing zone you're looking for when you're, uh, when you're doing an endovascular repair. You try to avoid thrombus and you try to avoid cal calcium. And clamping more proximally is not more dangerous. I would argue that clamping more proximally saves, uh, saves a lot of embolization and a lot of uh, heartache when you're trying to do a proximal anastomosis. Uh, whenever you move in the clamp uh, is a very bad thing, especially in the thoracic aorta. The thoracic aorta is much softer than the inferior aorta and it does not tolerate you um, being a, a mediocre technician. Black one. <laughs> so spinal cord ischemia is really the most dreaded complication. When you talk to these patients beforehand, they'd actually rather die than have a, a spinal cord complication. But it is a, a significant problem in these patients, especially if you're, you're reconstructing much of the operations. As I mentioned, each one of these uh, major centers that does these operations has their own uh, way of doing it. Um, we tend to use a spinal drain, keep the pressures up. Uh, we do not use a naloxone. Uh, and we reimplant uh, T8 to T12 if we, if we can. Uh, we do it on a separate uh, tube or a separate limb instead of doing a patch because if this breaks down or has problems, then you can ligate it and uh, take the risk of complications. The, um, the, the, 
This kind, of, this kind of reconstruction up here is called the tongue beveled anastomosis. It's one way to, with one patch and one anastomosis, to include the left, uh, or excuse me, the right uh, SMA and celiac uh, on one. Uh, the picture down below is a really old, about a 25-year-old picture where we used to bypass to the SMA, uh, either from the, pro from the proximal thoracic aorta or from it. Rich, the reason I include it, because Rich Cambria will take a shunt and place it into the SMA as he's doing the proximal, and then move the clamp down so he can have SMA perfusion. Oddly enough, SMA has been shown to be much more important for the uh, uh, coagulation issues in thoracoabdominals and the celiac uh, axis. Uh, I'll talk just two minutes on um, different approaches to the aorta. Again, was mentioned before, most, of, uh, most people are trained transabdominal. I grew up in Boston and trained in Boston. I was trained transabdominally. But essentially, the aorta is a retroperitoneal organ, and you can move the, the bowels either medially or laterally, uh, either in a Cattell or Maddox-type maneuver. But really, when you look at it, if you just go uh, in the extended posterior approach, you're right into the retroperitoneum and get to the aorta nice and easily, as opposed to have to wading through all of these bowel things that people do. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about how you get to how you get to the aorta. We place the patient in a right lateral acuitus position with the left arm over, uh, much like this. And this is a diagram. We do all of our open ruptures when we do them through the retroperitoneum. Uh, I, I find it a lot easier than doing it transabdominally. Uh, one of the things, keynotes you need to me, need to know is flexing the left knee uh, and leg allows you uh, good access to the iliac vessels because it relaxes the psoas muscle. Uh, Ten, we make an a tenth interspace incision from the lateral board of the rectus, um, and just use a, a small self-retaining retractor to get good exposure. If we have to get to the right side, we'll make a superingual incision over there. Key notes of this is the cruise comes right over, right proximal to the left, uh, left renal artery. Uh, the first thing you need to do is make sure you ligate the lumbar branch left renal artery. This brings the left renal vein uh, up so, you, so it's way out of your face. And, and then you don't have to worry about uh, the duodenum because the du duodenum's wrapped in the peritoneum and is, and is far away from your proximal anastomosis. Um, we've done some uh, um, things that people <laughs> think are not good, but you really just, again, need to know your three-dimensional uh, three image of exactly where all these vessels come off, because unfortunately they don't label them like they do in this diagram. The celiac axis is going to come off almost straight and go to the right. The SMA is going to come off uh, far away from you from this approach, and the right renal artery is over, the, over your horizon, so you really have to uh, palpate it to, to feel it. The left renal artery, if you're exposing this correctly, should go straight up in a perpendicular fashion off of the aorta, and that relaxes the, um, the uh, ureter so you don't rip it or cause any problems. And here's just a picture of the SMA here um, and the renals. Uh, this was a transaortic endoterectomy I did at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, if you just slip your index finger lateral to the aorta, uh, and once you tie the lumbar branch left renal vein, as you see here, you can just uh, you can um, cut with impunity everything lateral to that, and that will expose the supraceliac aorta. Uh, again, if you're doing a rupture, all you have to do is slip your left hand in that uh, paraguttural uh, para, uh, gutter, gutter behind it, get to the diaphragm, take a right at the di or take a left at the diaphragm, and you can compress the aorta uh, while they resuscitate the patient. Uh, again, one of the uh, contrary things we do is we transect the aorta completely. When you're coming from the lateral side, you don't have to worry about the lumbar arteries and veins. Just don't pass point because you can get the vena cava, which can cause a little more festivity than you would particularly like. We also uh, parachute the anastomosis proximally uh, so, we can see, uh, so we can see the entirety of the uh, anastomosis and it makes us feel much more comfortable when we're doing it with a fellow or a resident. And so lastly, I'll just talk about how you get to the right renal from this. Once you transect the aorta, actually, you can pull the, pull the aorta a little bit laterally and this brings the right renal artery out. And from this picture, you can see the right renal artery is here. Usually use the curved coolie to hold onto it. And the left renal artery is here. <laughs> do the proximal, uh, proximal anastomosis first, then uh, do the right renal artery, and then the left renal artery. Actually, the left renal artery we've had more complications with because uh, it's redundant. When you let the kidney down, it can, it can cause some kinking. And this is the uh, conclusion of that operation. Some of the inherent problems with the retroperitoneal approach is a splenic injury, and we usually just open the peritoneum to make sure there's no blood in there. If you're doing a redo, you can tear the ureter, which I've done twice. Vena cava injuries, is, uh, as I mentioned, is interesting. And we're becoming more and more comfortable now with the cardiac surgeons uh, helping them do arch aneurysms. Uh, as was mentioned last, we do a lot of ascending debranching with them, and then either at the time of surgery doing a, uh, an endograft or waiting a couple days and doing it uh, transfemorally. So 
Um, and I will stop there. This is a picture Alan sent, which you can also debranch the visceral vessels, which I don't think works extremely well, and I'd rather do a type 4 thoracoabdominal with it. And this is the uh, picture uh, of one of our debranchings, the head's on the left and the foot's on the right. This is the heart here. This goes to the anomenate, to the, to the carotid, and to the left subclavian. A lot of times you can't get to the left subclavian easily, so you end up uh, doing a carotid subclavian, and this is a bigger picture of it uh, from one of our, the operations that we did a couple of weeks ago. I'm just going to stop with one last operation. Uh, we had a 26-year-old Marfan's patient with a type A dissection came in with a type with a type B dissection and rupture in her chest. We fixed that endovascularly, put some coils in it. We thought we were out of the woods with that because we uh, um, could put the uh, proximal portion of that uh, T-var into uh, into her reconstructed uh, ascending. Unfortunately, after th two months or three months, her her distal aorta grew. And so what we did is a, in an operation that Gib Upchurch has now popularized, which I think works extremely well, is we sewed into the T-var uh, through a thoracal uh, retroperitoneal exposure, bypassed each one of the uh, blood vessels separately, uh, and reimplanted the left renal artery, and then went down to her uh, iliac bifurcation. So we also did a right axe fem bypass just to, to we, again, are seeing more and more primarily myconic thoracic aneurysms, which um, we've d treated both endo and open, uh, and there's some other uh, pathology you can see. So uh, anyway, I want to thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. So don't forget about open surgery. It's not bad. We still do, in our institution, we do four to one endo versus open, but we still do around uh, close to 100 open aortic reconstructions, either for occlusive disease or aneurysm disease a year. So thanks very much.